Hey everybody, it is Friday, June 5th, 2020. Time is about 11.50 CDT. It is 79 degrees Fahrenheit out and it is GeoRant time number 128. We are gonna shift gears a little bit here and I'm going to talk about the Black Hills area. Everything you're gonna see in slides and whatnot it derives from these first two publications. The Black Hills are significant because they're an area of rich mineral resources. They've been studied for a very long time in geology. We went there for field camp, for the first part of our field camp, as most people do, and it's very geologically interesting. In a nutshell, from the first publication that you saw, this is what, this is a very oversimplified map of the area, all right? You have this reddish-pink core, that's your Precambrian crystalline rocks, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. And from there, the rocks progressively get younger, Devil's Tower's up here. I've did that, been there a couple of times and taken you there before. So we're going to study this because when you do field camp, you study this stuff. And the orogeny and earth movements that produced it today is a talk for another time and is only the most recent in a long history of orogenic events in the area. And orogenic events are mountain building events. All right. And I am going to end up showing you a bunch of block diagrams. Block diagrams are a way to show you a, basically as if somebody took a perfectly chunk, perfect cube or rectangle, you know, chunk out of the earth and is displaying it for you. And you're gonna see these again, but I, they're the original black and white. I colored these here. I didn't have time to color the bigger slides so you can see them, but these are block diagrams. So essentially the white stuff is the surface, all right? And then these are the cuts into the earth. But I just wanted to show you that so you can get a concept if you don't know what a block diagram is. But we are going to be talking about a specific part of time. We're going to be talking about the Neo-Archean or Late Archean through the beginning of the Paleoproterozoic or early Paleoproterozoic. Now, that publication was 2008. I, this is the 2009 GSA uh, geologic time scale for the Precambrian. And it's only a year after that was made, and it's not much different than the previous one. So I just wanted to show you this because this one's in color. All right. Over here, I just made the numbers bigger so you could see them. There's the arrows where they're drawn from so you can see the boundaries. But I will do this really quickly just so you can get a look at it. And you see that yellow highlighted area? It says 250 MA. That's the time span we're going to be talking about today. It's that little time span. This is the whole of the Precambrian. We're going to be talking about this little part, and a lot happened in that little part. And the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic, all that other stuff more recently that everyone's familiar with, dinosaurs, land, animals, you know, multicellular life, that's all up here and probably that much of a chunk. It's not even, I didn't even put it on here. All right, proportionally, it's probably about, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, maybe about that, that much. Because the Precambrian is over 88% of the entire history of the Earth. So it's a large chunk of time. All right, let's get into this a little bit. But first, I need to show you, I made this little, this is not an actual stratigraphic column. You wouldn't make one like this, but I just wanted to show you how the units relate to one another within the block diagrams you're going to see. There's this I did. There are two, the literature mentions two firm dates. That's the orange. Uh, the yellows are my approximations based off of the other stuff I read. Uh, I don't, I know, there may be the maps, the geologic maps associated with that publication have better, more dates. I don't know, but these are the only two that are there. What you'll see here is you see the squiggly lines, which are unconformities. You see a question mark here because there may or may not be an unconformity there. I don't know. Uh, you see one here, and here you see a question mark. So you're going to see those on the block diagram. They have a unit up there with question marks above the benchmark iron formation, above that BIF, uh, as a unit that apparently is no longer there or whatever. They don't explain it, so I don't know, <laughs> okay? Uh, what you'll have here is you have this Box Elder formation, which that's this here, Box Elder Creek, and you have many different very thick lithostratigraphic units within it. This blue draw metagabro sill one of the dated things is a thousand meters thick. That's over 3,000 feet. So this is a very thick unit and you can see my estimated time span of deposition is only, what, 20 million years? And it actually starts in the Archean. So the Archean Paleoproterozoic line somewhere in here. And I have talked about this before, that is not uncommon in the Precambrian at all. 
especially in the Paleoproterozoic and the Mesoproterozoic. All right, so these thick basins do happen. All right, so I just want to show you this. These little drawings, lines, circles, and stuff are the same ones you're going to see on the block diagrams. Like I said, it did not have time to color them. We know this is a sill. It's an intrusion. Yeah, so the what you're basically going to see in the block diagrams is you're going to see this get deposited and then this and the tectonics evolved in between. So let's get to that. Uh, first of all, I am going to show you, you're going to see A, B, C, and D blocks. This is the figure description, figure two, of each block. You can pause that, read that if you want. I will do this for you too, just so you can, uh, in case you need a little, little closer of a zoom. All right, so let's get to it. So the Black Hills is geologically complex today, but they have been so in the past as well. All right, this here. A, here's our block diagram. This is a surface. There is likely C over this, water. They just didn't put it in this one. And the other ones, I did color water. I did do that, just to kind of give you a reference point. And as you can see, here's our metasedimentary Archean rocks. They have question marks there because it's not exposed at the surface. Uh, so they don't know exactly where this line is. They just know it's there. And like I said, this is a thousand meters, so that gives you a general idea of how thick the rest of the units are. All right, so what you have here is here's your banded iron formation, this cross hatched. Here's that question mark area. But what happened is after this was deposited and exposed on the surface through uplift or whatever erosion occurred, um, maybe that was an or the first orogenic event, all right, in the area. Uh, it's not very well exposed, not very well understood. But anyway, after that, subsidence occurred. And what we think happened is this is this probably is not an exact passive margin sequence, but it, it's close. Uh, or it, it's a like an intercratonic basin right on the edge of a passive margin. So we had rifting going on somewhere, okay, during this time. And it probably started during the Archean because there is a granite in there. You saw it on the on the previous, uh, on my strat column, if you will. Uh, it is there. So this, it does represent some sort of rifting deposits. And as the basin would have subsided, you would have got more and more sediments because the sea would have relatively transgressed, even though sea level may not have changed that much. Right? But the landscape subsided. So then time goes on. Right? Subsidence stops. Okay? It stops. But before the deposition of this stuff, this probably the, the bit for sure, a little bit under it and the stuff over it, before that compression starts, we start to get a closing of that rift. So we start, we, we start getting the middle of a Wilson cycle, okay? And this happens, you start to get deformation. And anybody who has flown over certain parts of the United States will often see this type of chevron looking stuff from the airplane. Well, yeah, in, in mountainous areas because you have mountain ranges forming. So we had a mountain range forming as this sea closed. And your dip direction, your, like these are what we call, this isn't, uh, let's see, make sure I get this right. Yes. Okay. This is a open anticline separated by open synclines, all right? These things have plunging axes on them, and that's a structural geology lecture, and it, structural geology is how we figure a lot of this stuff out, and there's a lot of mass involved in structural geology. Anyway, but as the close, the or orogeny began, and uplift began, deposition ceased, and you see this future site of the Estes growth fault, you're going to have weak zones. You're going to get folding, which is ductal deformation, but you're also going to get brittle deformation or faulting. And as time went on, not too much longer after this, the orogeny that formed that, that formed that mountain range stopped. And so the area subsided a little and erosion continued enough so to bring things down to sea level. The box elder before I get into that. The box elder, this one, the white parts, were fluvial deposits derived from the north. So there was already tectonic activity going on while the box elder was being deposited, it just wasn't local. 
and it migrated to the area, all right? So this is C, and here we have our C, S-E-A, <laughs> C block diagram, C-S-E-A, transgressing over the land as subsidence began, but not too much subsidence. You can still see the mountain range is still kind of there. It's been significantly eroded. Estes growth fault, as this orogeny ceased, formed, that lifted this area up relative to this, which also would have helped the sea come in. And you start getting this Estes formation. Here's some paleo topography on top of the BIF. So you get the Estes formation, which is shed as alluvial fan deposits from this area. All right, so you have paleo topography and you have a new episode of deposition. Something, you know, kind of sort of similar to what happened at Baraboo, Wisconsin, you know, between the Precambrian and the Cambrian. Okay, it's something similar. It's not an exact analogy, but it's, it, it, it's similar things. All right, so and here's our D. Block diagram D. As time went on, the Estes growth fault continued to grow, so you would have had thicker uplift and more subsidence. And this, this is a normal fault, right? It's not a reverse. So there would have been, you know, you had a lowering of the area through extension, probably just compensation from the end of a Wolfson cycle. And the sea comes in even more and you get you get more deposition that's more conducive of marine deposits. You get this dolo aronite, they call it. See right there, this thin bed, which is basically just a dolomitic sandstone. And then you get this quartzite on top of it. And, you know, that ceased at about, you know, what do I have there? 2350 million years ago. And that would later be preserved and recycled to another orogenic event, which is more modern, which has happened more recently than that. But anyway, this is 12 minutes, so I'm going to cut it off here. Anyway, that's it. If you have any questions or comments below, please leave them, and I hope you learned something.